may you look after yourself with ease. It's the message of the chant that we chant every night, every morning. That's an expression of goodwill. And looking after yourself here means both physically and mentally. Physically, may you be healthy. If your health is bad, may it be the sort of thing where you know how to care for it and it doesn't take too much effort. But more importantly, you want to learn how to look after your mind and learn how to do it with ease. So the issues in the mind are not a constant struggle. And you don't need to be depending on other people to solve the problems for you. You see a problem come up in the mind, and another part of the mind can look at it and see what's wrong, recognize what's wrong, and have an antidote. That requires training. And a lot of looking after your mind means basically knowing how to talk to yourself. Like right now, we're setting, getting the mind to be settled down. And there's a certain amount of talking to yourself that you have to do. You want to do it in a way that's skillful. That actually does bring the mind to a more still state where you can put all that chatter aside. And talking to the mind is an important part of the meditation. Don't think of it just as an unfortunate thing that happens to be happening as you're trying to get the mind concentrated. It is an essential part of the concentration. And you would learn how to rope in the mind's thoughts and gather them in closer and closer and closer to a sense of stillness. So right now you're talking to yourself about the breath. How is the breath going? Is it comfortable? Where is it right now? Where do you feel the breath? When you breathe in, does it feel like you're fully nourishing your torso? Is it nourishing the nerves? Is it nourishing your eyes, your ears? Think of the breath as the flow of energy in the body and where it would feel good for that flow to go. Then once it feels good, how can you make it spread? So it suffuses the entire body with a sense of well-being. That's a skillful way of talking to yourself. And then you begin to notice at one point you've got the breath as good as it's going to be. It's good enough to settle down with. And then you can put all that chatter aside and just plow into the breath. But to know when that spot is, that requires that you talk to yourself too. So these are some skillful ways of talking to yourself to get the mind to settle down. There are other times when you're not in formal meditation and you need to know how to talk to the mind, especially when it's getting obsessed with something that's really not good for it. And here your internal chatter can be informed by some reflections on what the Buddha has to say about right speech. To, to begin with, right speech grows out of right resolve, as we chanted just now. Resolve for renunciation, resolve for non ill will, resolve for harmlessness. If you find the mind is getting obsessed with sensual pleasures or sensual objects, ideas, desires, how do you talk to it? So it can begin to see that you don't really need that. Because the mind will keep saying, I need this pleasure, I need that pleasure. You have to learn how to counter that justification. Because you don't really need these things. There are other pleasures that the mind can have that will nourish it in a much more substantial way. And as for ill will, we don't usually think that we have ill will for ourselves. But then if you find yourself thinking about how you might want to give up on the practice, you have to ask yourself, do you really love yourself? Because you started this practice because you noticed that you were causing yourself unnecessary suffering. And this is the path out of that suffering. Why would you want to give up? If you really loved yourself, you wouldn't think in those terms. The same with resolve on harmlessness. We don't like to think that we would harm ourselves, but we go out and we do things that are really stupid. because we don't really care about the consequences. 
You say, well, if the consequences take for them, care of themselves, I'm going to do what I feel like doing right now. That's a way of harming yourself. You've got to think down the line, as the Buddha says. Ask yourself, what would be for my long-term welfare and happiness? When you find yourself tempted to give in to a desire to do or say or think something that's going to be bad for you, ask yourself, how am I going to feel tomorrow from having done this? Remember the times when you were able to say no to yourself and how much better it felt the next day. So these are some of the lessons from Right Resolve. The lessons from Right Effort, how you motivate yourself to keep on going. The Lord has a list of what he calls three governing principles. And there are different ways of motivating yourself to stick with a practice. One is the Dharma as a governing principle. In other words, thinking about what a good dharma this is, and why I'd be ashamed to wander away from it. In this case, you use a sense of inspiration to keep you going. There's the self as a governing principle, and this again is very much like that one about do you really love yourself? You see that you're suffering, and a lot of the Suffering comes from you. In fact, all the unnecessary suffering comes from you. And when are you going to stop? And if you put it off to some other lifetime or sometime later in this lifetime, well, it doesn't get easier with time. If you really love yourself, talk to yourself in ways that keep you going. And there's finally a sense of shame. It's, the Buddha calls it. The world is a governing principle. When you think about the fact that there are people in the world who can read other people's minds, suppose they were to read your mind right now, what would they think? So these are some things to keep in mind as you're chatting to yourself about the practice, about where you're going on the practice. And a sense of inspiration with what you want to stick with it. Then, of course, are the lessons of right speech itself. As Buddha said, the things he would talk to him about are one, true, two, beneficial, three, timely. So if something comes up in the mind, ask yourself, is this really true? And part of the mind will say, yes, it's really true. That's when you have to question it. To what extent is the opposite true? Can you think in that way? This is a good break on obsessive thinking. That grabs onto one little, one little detail or one little idea and just runs with it without any concern about where it's going to go. You have to be able to check yourself. To what extent is this thought out of balance, even if it is true? Then is it really true? The mind can convince itself of the truth of all kinds of stupid things. You've got to learn to, how to step back and question these things. I saw a case in my own family years back. My father was going through a severe depression. I came back from Thailand to talk to him. And I found the best thing, one, was not to mention the B word as we were talking, and two, to let him talk. And after a couple of days of talking, he's, he sat bolt upright in bed. and said something that indicated what the real problem was, and he hadn't himself realized what the problem was. He had been feeling guilty about his first marriage to my mother, and I was involved in a really bad second marriage. And He sat up in bed and he said, well, maybe if this marriage fails, it's not my fault. And that was what had been weighing on him for months before I was able to get back. And just learning how to question that, I mean, he just got well within the next three days. So you may find that you're obsessed with something that you think is really true, some issue that you feel weighs the mind down, but you don't see any way out of it. You've got to learn how to question it. And sometimes talking to yourself in the right way can clear up all kinds of problems. 
And of course, even if things really are true, then the next question is, are they beneficial? Is it good for you to be thinking this thought, talking to yourself in those, this way? Where is this going to lead? Think about the consequences of your thinking. Then finally have a sense of time and place. When is the right time to think? When is the right time not to think? When is the time to come down harsh on yourself and your internal chatter? And one of the times to be comforting. There'll be a part of the mind that one of the main defilements that keeps people from staying on the path is this tendency to be overcritical. This is no good. That's no good. I might as well give up. That's what it's saying. Well, one, it's not beneficial to begin with. But you have to realize those are the times when you have to talk to yourself in a comforting way. Part of the mind will say, well, those comforting th thoughts are just Pollyannish ideas. Well, you know, Pollyanna did well. She wasn't that stupid. You look at all the great Ajans, they were really good at encouraging themselves. They recognized their faults, that's for sure, but they also recognized that they had good potentials within them and found them where other people might not have found them. After all, you think most of the Johns came from really poor families in a very backward area of Thailand, didn't have much education. People from outside looking at them would have said, no, there's, there's no chance, there's no way these people are going to gain awakening. Yet they found that they could. They proved the rest of the world wrong. Well, you can prove your defilements wrong by defying them. Say, there's got to be something good here, otherwise I wouldn't have even thought of practicing. So learn to ferret out your good qualities. But it's this ability to know how to talk to yourself. That's how you look after your mind. And it can make all the difference in the world, whether you stick with the practice or not. So be very careful about what you say to yourself. And if anything that the mind is talking about begins to seem harmful, question it. There's another thing that keeps people from making progress on the path, is getting obsessed. With some idea that proves to be proves to be harmful, so you have to learn how to step back from your obsessions. This is especially important as you're developing powers of concentration, because the more concentration you can develop in the mind, the more you do tend to be obsessed. After all, you're being obsessed with the breath right now. But the basic method gives you the tools for turning that obsession into a kind of balance. You're noticing. As the Buddha says, what you're doing to fabricate your sense of the body by the breath, what you're doing to fabricate the sense of the mind by the way you perceive things, the images you hold in mind, the words you hold in mind as you, as you meditate, and then what you can do to calm that fabrication. In other words, bring things into balance. So the state of mind you've got here is something that you can maintain with ease. And it's something you can stick with for long periods of time and not feel out of balance. And the more you gain a sense of balance with this exercise, the more you'll be able to recognize when your own mind is getting out of balance in other areas. So learn how to talk to yourself with ease, because that's how you look after the mind.